October 25th, 2018. Um, I'm here in New York City, New York, uh, with the Stonewall 162 Project, conducting an interview with uh, my narrator named... Marshall W. Mason. Great. Nice to meet you, Mr. Mason. Pleasure. Um, so can you tell me, uh, what was your birth date, and when were you born? February 24, 1940. I was born in Amarillo, Texas. Um, Amarillo, Texas. Yeah. My childhood, well, I didn't grow up in Amarillo. I grew up in uh, a small town in southern Texas called Luling. It's down near about 35, 40 miles from Austin and 60 miles from San Antonio. So they're a little town there, about 4,000 people. Uh, and um, I lived with my grandparents because my mother had moved on. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they were, uh, huh? She went on to, uh, she had a new baby um, who was six years younger than me, so he was a baby. Uh, when I was, I, I guess I was eight when I moved to Luling. Uh, I'd gone to the first couple of grades, a grade and a half in Amarillo, and then when she moved to New Orleans, I went south to Luling to live with my grandparents, and I was with them until uh, junior high when uh, I decided Luling was too small and wanted to move to back to Amarillo, which is a b relatively big city. And I moved back there for a year. Uh, and then I moved back to Luling for a year. And then I moved back to Amarillo to finish high school. So it was back and forth. But my childhood was mainly with my grandparents, uh, a small town, as I said, and uh, two movie theaters. Um, went to the movies a lot on the weekends, you know, Saturday. Um, and um, I don't know what else to say other than, uh, you know, uh, it was um, a very imaginative childhood. I mean, I, I wrote a novel when I was 12. Uh, my father gave me a typewriter for, uh, for my 12th birthday present, and so I wrote a novel uh, called uh, The Secret of the Antarctic. <laughs> was it published? No, 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 no. Uh, I. Uh, it was just, it was a crazy, you know, science fiction adventure sort of thing. I, I loved to, to play time travel and stuff like that when I was a, a child, very imaginative stuff. And uh, my best friend was a guy named Gene England, who is now a retired professor at uh, Indiana State University. He, uh, he was an English teacher. And uh, he and I really had a lot of uh, fun playing imaginative type games like time travel, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and um, I was an only child uh, until my brother was born. And he, he, he's my half-brother, and so I never lived with him um, at all. Well, only when he was a baby, when the first year and a half of his life. Um, and um, my father was a, uh, a chef, uh, or a cook anyway, a, 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 short order cook, uh, he had been a chef at a ho hotel. He lived in Amarillo and I went back to Amarillo to, to live with him when I got to be a teenager. Uh, so um, I, I was looking for more opportunities, as I said. And uh, in Amarillo, I was able to uh, take part in the debate club and, uh, and uh, the theater, the, uh, I could act and uh, what have you. And uh, also, uh, I played in the marching band, which I started when I was eight years old, uh, in the eighth grade, uh, down in Luling. And I played there for a couple of years, and then I went to Amarillo and played all the way through high school. And then I went to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where I played in the band for four years. So I had a lot of, uh, pl I played the bass horn, uh, in case you were wondering. <laughs> well, I, here's a question, though. Okay. No, no, no. I wish I did, but no. Yeah, when I went to Europe the first time, I had a big trunk full of uh, memorabilia from my childhood. Great, uh, you know, report cards, probably my my book and what have you, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, I left it in somebody's basement while I was in Europe. You know, first time uh, they had a flood of some kind and everything was destroyed. So well, that's, that's I had to let go of it. You know, okay. yeah. Um, Western, and then uh, you played the, you were in the band, and you had this book in there. 
After, uh, at Northwestern. Yeah, at Northwestern. Well, in, I went to Northwestern because they had the best theater uh, school in the country, reputed to be, and uh, I, man I thought I was going to go to the University of Texas all my life, uh, but, uh, and I had a small scholarship at the University of Texas, and it would have been easy to do that. But I, when I heard about Northwestern's theater department, I knew that that's where I wanted to go. And I was a poor kid, but I managed to get a full scholarship at, to Northwestern. Otherwise, I couldn't have gone, because Northwestern was very, very, very expensive. It's like, they call it the Harvard of the Midwest. It's a very expensive school. What year was this? Did you start so, in what year? Uh, 1957, I graduated from high school, okay. and I graduated from Northwestern in 1961. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so at Northwestern, I acted and, um, I began directing when I was 19. Uh, I directed, my first play was Cat and Hot and Roof. Uh, and r the reason I chose that play was because um, it had, the themes of the, of the Cat and Hot and Roof were things that were very personal and real to me. First of all, it's about a football player. I'm from Texas. You know, football is your religion in Texas. And I had grown up at all the football games playing in the band. Uh, it's all also very much about um, um, a, a, an alcoholic, uh, and my father was an alcoholic, so that I related to that. And um, it was about mendacity, as Big Daddy uh, calls it. And uh, I felt, uh, coming out of the Eisenhower years, that, that there was a lot of bullshit uh, in society that was not acknowledged. So I, I wanted to do a play about that. But more, most importantly, I guess, was the, the question of Brick's sexuality. Because he, uh, as a football player, um, you know, uh, he had a, f a friend, a special friend, uh, named Skipper. And um, Skipper uh, kills himself when uh, Brick's wife uh, uh, brings up the idea that maybe there was something unnatural about their relationship. And Skipper killed himself rather than face the truth. Uh, and, uh, and Brick has turned into a complete alcoholic as a result of, you know, causing his friends um, suicide and also running from his sexuality. Now, I had seen the movie of Cat when I was uh, in high school uh, in Amarillo. I had seen uh, Cat on a Hutton Roof, uh, the movie, uh, in high school with, uh, you know, uh, Paul Newman and, and uh, Elizabeth Taylor. And Burl Ives, Madeline Sherwood. And I had uh, really liked the movie. It was a very good movie and very, very well done. But the whole issue of Brick's homosexuality was completely unspecified and undramatized. Uh, he was, for some reason, not sleeping his wa with his wife, but we didn't know why. And we don't, weren't sure exactly why Skipper killed himself or any of that. It was all. Uh, really alluded to in the movie, but, but not explicit. Uh, while I was in high school, I've just written a book, by the way, called The Transcendent Years, in which I talk about my childhood and Northwestern quite a lot, and how uh, some of the stuff that I'm telling you is m more vividly told in my book. Um, while I was in high school, though, I, uh, I would go to the Emerald High School Library and read um, the uh, Burns Mantle Yearbook of the, the best plays of the best plays annual it was called, and so I read a lot about Tennessee Williams and about Arthur Miller and uh, and uh, about my hero Eli Kazan, whom I had first seen in a movie called Pinky when I was living in Luling. I was eight years old. I went to see a movie called Pinky, uh, which is about a black woman uh, passing as white, uh, and she falls in love with a white doctor. And uh, then she goes back to uh, the South, and of course, you know, that nothing can happen like that down there. So uh, it was a, a movie about discovering who you are and uh, being true to it. And it moved me tremendously. Um, so I, uh, it was directed by Ilya Kazan. So right away, at the age of eight, I said, oh, Ilya Kazan's my favorite director, having no idea really what a director was. But uh, now, 19 years, at, at the age of 19, uh, eight, 11 years later, um, Cat was the, the play that I chose to direct first on, uh, at first, and it had been done on Broadway by Ilya Kazan uh, with uh, Barbara Bel Geddes. 
And um, I had, so I read about the production, and I, of course, had read the play, and I knew the movie didn't really do it, so I thought, well, I can really do it, and so I did. And it was a great success. Um, I discovered that I was a director, uh, and um, so I was, I was hooked on directing from that point on. And so, <coughs> so you left North, after Northwestern, uh, where did you go? New York. Yeah, directly in New York. Okay, and that was probably, you said 1961, 61? 61. Okay. And so what was life, what did you do in New York, and what was life like in New York in Well, I right away uh, had the very good fortune of discovering the Cafe Chino on Cornelia Street. Uh, which was in the West Village. Sorry? Which Cornelia, which is in the West Village. In the, in the village, yeah, in the West Village. It's uh, between 6th Avenue and Bleecker Street. Uh, it's uh, only a block long. And uh, at 31 Cornelia Street was a wonderful place called the Cafe Chino, which, by the way, was the first gay theater. And um, just, I was just at an event uh, Monday night, uh, or Tuesday night it was, uh, for the National Register has, uh, has recognized Cafe Chino as the birthplace of gay theater. And so there's, there's going to be a plaque put up there or something. Uh, but I walked into that world, which was quite a wonderful magic world. It was run by a fellow named Joe Chino, who had been a dancer. Uh, he was from Ro uh, Rochester or Buffalo, I think it was, actually. And he was in his mid-30s at that point, and a little overweight, and so he was no longer dancing. So he had started this coffee shop, and then, uh, in, you know, at that time, people were doing poetry readings, that sort of thing. But... Uh, Joe wanted, you know, people came to him and said, I've got a play, I want to do a play. He said, oh, okay. He was always very broad-minded, anything you want to do. So uh, a fellow named Doric Wilson uh, did the first play that I saw at the Chino when I arrived in 1961. It was called Now She Dances, and it was the story of Salome uh, told in the style of Oscar Wilde. Now, of course, Salome wrote uh, Salome, but not in the style that he was accustomed to writing. So this play was, was written the way Oscar Wilde should have written it, in the style of uh, The Importance of Being Earnest. And it starred my, uh, my good friend from Northwestern, a woman named Jane Lowry, who had been an inspiration to uh, Doric. Their first play there had been called And He Made a Her, which was about Adam and Eve, which also starred J uh, uh, Jane. And, but the first one I saw uh, was uh, uh, Now She Dances, and it was tremendously funny, and it was a uh, uh, John the Baptist was uh, portrayed as sort of a early, I don't know, Larry Kramer, uh, I guess, kind of a you know a prophet of, of I don't know if, if actually the word gay is even mentioned in the play, but you sort of got the feeling that that's what it was about. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, gay ch the Chino did a lot of plays, um, and uh, I. I it was a couple of years later, uh, I arrived there in 61, uh, and in, uh, I guess it was 64, uh, three years after I first arrived there, I, I met, well actually, yeah, I met Lanford Wilson, uh, and Lanford uh, had, uh, his first play there was a thing called Home Free, which I really loved, which I subsequently, many years later, directed in London. Um, and um, his second play was a play called The Madness of Lady Bright, and it was the first play that depicted a drag queen on stage, uh, and it was a really wonderful play. It ended up playing, uh, in the long run, 250 performances at the Cafe Chino off, off Broadway. So it was a huge hit, a su big success, and it was a really touching, very, very moving uh, play about uh, a, a queen who was really going nuts uh, and uh, lonely, nobody to relate to. And he, uh, he, his wall is, uh, is a freshly painted wall, it was freshly painted, and he brought home a trick uh, named Adam. And Adam said, oh, a fresh wall, let me put my name on it so you'll remember me. And so wrote Adam real big on it. And subsequently, and this was the, the guy that got away, as it were, the, the love of his life that did the further one night stand. And subsequently, uh, all the men that Leslie, Leslie Bright, uh, picks up and is brought to uh, this little apartment uh, have left their name. 
So there, the whole wall is filled with autographs. And um, this was, uh, as I said, 1964. And uh, it, was, it was a great, wonderful play. I directed it subsequently in London in 1968, uh, where it was uh, called the finest performance to be seen in London at that time. So um, it was, I was right there at the very beginning of, of gay theater in New York. Uh, you know, Mark Crowley came along later with that stupid play, uh, Boys in the Band, which, I mean, we're full of self-hate and, you know, didn't care a lot for it. I mean, I was happy that somebody was doing a play about gay people, but it was not a play that, that um, I thought was very uh, um, enlightened uh, in any way. I don't know if you saw the recent Broadway production. Did you see no, it? I it? it. It's gone. It, was, it was, came and went, but, you know, you didn't miss anything. Uh, it's still the same place, still filled with self-hate, and, it, you know, I, don't, I didn't care for it. Um, but uh, the village at that time, um, as I, said, I spent a lot of time at the Cafe Chino, uh, uh, directing plays, and when I wasn't directing something, I would go there and see plays. Joe, uh, after hours there, we, we would do Greek dancing. Uh, you put pull all the chairs aside, and then we'd hold hands and do Greek dancing on it. You know, all new world to me, kid from Texas, I didn't know anything about anything. So it was all very exciting uh, to me. Cafe Chino was decorated with Christmas tree lights. Uh, that were the only lights in the, in the room were all Christmas tree lights. This was long before people did that, you know. Uh, Johnny Dodd, who was the waiter, was the first man I ever saw with long hair uh, and uh, an earring. With long hair. Oh, okay. With long hair, yeah. She, long hair. Like shoulder-length or longer? Uh, I'm sorry? Or down to his shoulders? Shoulder-length, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah shoulder-length. Uh, and he wore an earring. I mean, again, this is <laughs> long before the era of hippies, so, I mean, by long, uh, several years. Uh, so um, we're talking early 60s, and, th you know, the hippie thing didn't come along until 68, so... This is long ahead of that. Um, I smoked my first joint. Uh, Johnny Dodd took me up to his apartment and gave me this joint. I was smoking it, and I didn't know what it was. And then he said something about, uh, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about marijuana. But, and I said, marijuana? Really? Is that what this is? I thought for sure I was hooked, because all I knew about it was what I had seen, you know, in, in movies like, uh, uh, what's that? the incredible famous movie, uh, um, ah, I can't think of it, the famous uh, anti-marijuana movie, uh, uh, it's extremely famous, I mean, I can't, I can't think of the name of it, anyway, uh, I thought it was hooked, went to the library the next day, looked up marijuana and discovered, oh no, it's all right. So it didn't have any problem. Um, the uh, I was. You want to hear about my sex, uh, sexual oh, sexuality? Yeah. I I was uh, being a, a kid from Texas. I was raised on you know this whole idea of masculinity, being a football player. Uh, I and I was a skinny kid, uh, and I was my self image was not terribly strong. I was an artist, and that was okay. But, you know, in the theater. Uh, you aren't persecuted the way I think a lot of people are. Uh, but uh, I didn't uh, deal with my sexuality at all. I was like brick. I was denying. And uh, I was only 21, you know, so I had a lot to learn yet. And um, um, I went to, I would every once in a while take a big risk and go out to a gay bar uh, because I knew I was attracted to men. Uh, and I the place I would go was the Cherry Lane on Commerce Street. And uh, it was a, you know, a lot of dancing and, and beer and what have you, but uh, not, you know, not, a, not a lot to talk about, really, Cherry Lane. And uh, there, at, the, at that time in New York, in uh, the early 60s, the only other gay bar that I know of was a bar on, I think, East 34th or 5th Street, something like that, called the hi-hat or top-hat, 
I think it was Chiap. Uh, I only, I, I think maybe I went there once, I don't remember. But this is long before even Uncle Charlie's or any of those, uh, or Julius's. Uh, Julius's might have been there. The Eighth Circle, I remember, uh, was there, or Ninth Circle, I mean, was there. But I don't know if they were gay as such uh, then. It was sort of closeted. The really out front gay bar, the only one that I can re really remember was uh, the Cherry Lane. Um, Did you ever go to Stonewall? To where? No, Stonewall wasn't there. Oh, when you were there? No, in 1961, no. No, no, there was no Stonewall. Um, Stonewall came along later. Uh, by then, I had, by the time Stonewall came along, I had uh, spent all my time you know, in the village and had um, created a theater uptown uh, on uh, 83rd and Broadway called the Circle Repertory Company. And we, uh, that was founded in uh, July of 1969. Now, what is the date of Stonewall, the riots? 60, uh, June 69. June 69, okay. That's when I started the theater. Well, July 14th, so the, the month after Stonewall. Yeah. So I was, I was living in the village, um, and uh, I came up out of the subway on Christopher Street and looked out across 7th Avenue, and I saw something was going on down the block. And it looked like a lot of policemen, a lot of lights, and you know, and a, kind of a, a, an uproar that I didn't want to get near. I didn't know what was going on, but I didn't go near it. Subsequently, uh, as I started the next month, we started the theater Circle Rep, and uh, one of my actors uh, from Circle Rep is named Bob Shields, and he's a straight guy, uh, married after I met him, a nice woman named uh, Alice Tweedy, and uh, Bob was walking by the stone wall and somehow saw the police brutalizing the gay people and he got involved and got a you know, bloody head from uh, uh, somebody, uh, the policeman hitting him over the head with the truncheon. Bob Shields, Bob Shields. Robert LA? Shields. Yeah, he's in LA. Okay, Bob. Yeah, Robert Shields. Uh, and um, anyway, he, uh, he was the only person that I knew who was actually there and uh, as, a, as ironic because he was straight, but he got involved. Um, mm, I, I don't know if I really have any more about Stonewall that I can tell you other than... Uh, you're, you're fine. Uh, so you were saying, I guess, if you started your play around July 14th, 1969, so obviously in those couple of weeks you were still going into the area. Oh yeah, I was living in the village. Oh, I, uh, I think I was in there once. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't for me. Uh, I had liked, there was no dancing, as I recall, in Stonewall. I mean, I don't remember any. I just remember a long bar and people at the bar, and then there was sort of uh, people hanging around, standing up against the wall in the back, back rooms. Uh, but I, it, it, um, I, I, I think it, there were a lot of, I believe quite a few drag queens there. And that was not my scene, you know. I uh, said uh, Butch thing. By that, by the, I don't know. Probably by the time Boots and Saddle had probably had come along by then, and uh, that was more of the kind of bar that I would hang out in, uh, more than Stonewall. Stonewall was, was uh, 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 catered, I think, to to uh, more flamboyant people. Um, Well, I remember the bars, there, you know, uh, there were leather bars and then there were uh, sweater bars, <laughs> you know, and uh, if you were, you know, butch, you went to the leather bars and if you were, you know, the, the sweater bars were a little more up, upper class, I guess, and, and not flamboyant, but effeminate, more effeminate. Uh, they, they wouldn't let you into uh, st the... Uh, Booth and Saddle, or one of those, uh, I can't remember the other names of the ones on Christopher Street down toward the, the uh, river uh, offhand. I can't think of their names. Booth and Saddle is, is still there. Uh, I, 
can't remember the names of the others. Um, but they wouldn't let you in if you didn't, if you were wearing a sweater, they wouldn't let you in. So it, it was uh, segregated in that kind of way. Uh, uh, and um, I was never very big into gay bars anyway. Uh, as I said, I was going through torturous trying to decide what my sexuality was. And uh, so I d it's not that I, and I, even to this day, I say, well, it just happens. Uh, uh, first thing that happened to me was uh, in 1963, I fell in love for the first time with a really beautiful man, 19. And uh, I was uh, 20, 20, 23, I guess. Uh, although I think it, it might have been in, in the fall of 62, I guess. No, 63, that's right. Anyway, uh, w when I fell in love, uh, you know, th there was never, no reason to go to a bar anymore. Uh, and I didn't meet him at a bar, I met him at a party. Um, so I really never really got in the habit of going to bars very much. Uh, and then that only lasted about a year. And then I met my next lover uh, at, um, got a bar on Christopher Street, uh, name of which I, I'm, I've, you know, lost so much memory, I, I can't remember the name of it, on Christopher right at uh, uh, Washington, at uh, uh, Greenwich, uh, Washington. No, Greenwich, Greenwich Street and, and Christopher. Um, it's a noodle shop now. It, you, and it was, for a while, it was a pornographic uh, bookstore uh, and movies and stuff like that for a long, long time. Oh, Danny's. It's called Danny's. <coughs> and I met my second lover there. <coughs> and um, all th this was both just before I started the theater. Uh, and once I got into the theater, I was just too busy, uh, you know, to hang out. Uh, what I did do, my, my gay life as such, uh, was um, I would go to the baths, uh, particularly the Continental Bath, where I would hear Bette Midler and uh, see... Uh, this is what, the 70s or Yeah, no, this is, yeah, 70s, early 70s. Um, <clears throat> Bette Midler singing and, um, uh, what's his name, playing the piano? Uh, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, was it Barry Manilow? Anyway, uh, I, I think it was Barry Manilow. Anyway, a, p a famous piano player who became a great musician later. I think it was Barry Manilow. Anyway, <coughs> so I went, would go and see Bet, and uh, basically I would spend, you know, the, the bath was really, Continental Bath was a luxurious, wonderful treat. I mean, they had huge bouquets of flowers overflowing and and you know, big Olympic-sized uh, swimming pool and uh, steam rooms and uh, saunas and everything. It was just really a luxurious place. Wonderful little cafe where you get something to eat. Um, I don't think they served liquor. I don't remember they had liquor, but uh, it was a really good place to spend the night. I mean, you know, not the whole night, but I would go and I would uh, cruise around until I found somebody I wanted. I would have sex with them and then go home. And so it was a one, one trick uh, pony for me. A lot of people hung out there and went over and over and over and over with many, many people. Um, but I, I just, I was uh, kind of puritanical, uh, I suppose, always. Coming from Texas, I, I guess it, would, it had that kind of background. Uh, so I was never what I would call promiscuous. Uh, other people, I think, would call me promiscuous if they, you know, depends on what standards you're using. But as gay people are concerned, uh, I was not promiscuous. Uh, I was very, as I said, one, one trick and I'd go home, uh, which is different from uh, the way a lot of guys uh, treated their, their gayness, their sexuality. Um,
Yeah, yeah. across Seventh Avenue. Did yeah. you know what was laying there? No, I wasn't sure. It just there was a. I saw a lot of police cars and and lights flashing and. You thought it was just another. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. I heard about it real soon. Oh. The, uh, the next day, I, I think, if not if not that night, I may have heard about it that night. I don't remember, but. Uh, that I, you know, subsequently learned that it had been uh, what they call the Stone, Stonewall Riot. Uh, I'm not sure, what, uh, it was a police riot is what it was, was. Uh, but uh, at that time, now the gay bars, Cherry Lane and all the others, uh, there weren't all that many of them. Stonewall was fairly, one of the early ones, but it wasn't there when I first got here. Uh, and uh, it was, Well, you know, uh, uh, the way you met people, I guess, was cruising on the street, what they call cruising. Just, you know, walk around and look and catch somebody's eye and that sort of thing. Always looking in the windows, you know, just shopping, you know, and so forth, and somebody turn around and see you. Um, I, as I said, I met my first lover I met at a party. Uh, he was just unbelievably my ideal. And I, my first thought was, why can't somebody like that be gay? And lo and behold, he was. Um, but uh, that, you usually picked up people uh, at you know, venues like that on the street or, or at a party. There were a couple of gay bars, but uh, um, certainly the Cherry Lane, as I said, had dancing. And I, I liked to dance. So that's why I preferred the Cherry Lane to other bars. Uh, like, like I, I don't remember any dancing at the stone wall. I just remember the long wall and uh, the long bar and sort of a back, back room where people sort of stood around, I think. I don't remember dancing. So in terms of the, as you said, the atmosphere again, what did you consider the, the sort of atmosphere like? Did, what was, the, was there a change in atmosphere before? Oh, yeah. Atmosphere? Well, uh, I, what I was starting to say about uh, uh, the atmosphere was that all the gay bars were um, paid off the mafia. They were all uh, probably mafia owned or run or regulated in some kind of way. Uh, so uh, there were payoffs, I know, of, of various kinds. And, and the police raided the gay bars quite regularly. Uh, I, I was at the Cherry Lane on a couple of occasions when the police would come in and all the lights would be turned on and everybody would stop dancing with each other, you know, everybody would separate, and the police would say, okay, we're closing this place, get out, you know, and so y you'd leave. They, they didn't arrest anybody that I saw. I, I, I was never arrested or anything, but, uh, you know, you, you realize that the police were hostile, uh, and um, that as I said, the, the, you knew there was a criminal element of some kind because uh, uh, it was all against the law, really against the law. And um, so just to you know, go to a gay bar was, was a, a, basically an illegal act at that point. Certainly dancing was, was you know, with another man, can't do it. So, um, and this really was the atmosphere of, whenever you went to anything like a gay bar, uh, uh, it was all illicit, and uh, the police were really hard on it, and uh, there, were, there were arrests, I'm sure. Uh, just that I never was arrested, but I, I definitely was at a couple of raids where I had to leave, you know, go home. The bar was closed. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I wasn't, as I said, because I wouldn't think of myself as very promiscuous. I didn't go out to gay bars all that often. So the fact that I was in a couple of places where they were raided, they must be, have been, for, for somebody who went to a lot of bars, they must have experienced this all the time. But I, I really didn't. Um, <clears throat> so it, it was, but the homosexuality was illegal and uh, the atmosphere was dangerous, uh, I think. Uh, as far as the law was concerned. I don't recall any uh, fears of, uh, of danger on the streets or anything. I mean, of, you know, people beating you up because you're gay. Although, I mean, you know, obviously that has happened a lot over, over the time, but not in New York. In New York, you were safe here, or at least you felt you were. And uh, I mean, I, I do remember a couple of instances where people were killed, you know, uh, on the street, but 
but that was that isolated incident. You know, you'd hear about, oh my God, somebody was killed on Christmas Street, uh, and you'd hear about it. But it was happened, you know, rarely, but it did happen. Um, eventually, at the end of Christopher Street, there were those uh, wharves going out into the river and uh, big trucks uh, with the back ends, and I think they were called the trucks. I think that's what when people go there to crew, and you'd get in the back of those trucks, it'd be like being in a, and of course, uh, uh, the, the sexuality became more and more licentious uh, until the, the uh, anvil and those uh, really, you know, extreme, what I would call extreme uh, visions of gay life, uh, way beyond leather, way beyond sweaters, when you get into the fisting and uh, the sex shows that were going on, and what have you. I, I, Went, I think I went to the Anvil once, and that was more than enough for me. I, not my scene at all. Um, so, and so these so you said after then, did you feel like Stonewall sort of changed things, or you know, how do you think Stonewall changed things? Yes. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the the gays stood up and and uh, fought back, and uh, things did change. Uh, not overnight, I don't believe, but, but uh, there, there was a sense of, you know, the gays are not going to take it anymore, and, and we, we I, not me personally, but, but we as a, a, a group of people fought back uh, against the law. And um, <clears throat> subsequently, as I said, I got a, a very involved. My activism had mainly to do with the theater. And uh, not only with the Madness of Lady Bright, but uh, other sexes between two people. There was a play called The Haunted Host by Robert Patrick. Have you talked to Robert, by the way? No, I haven't. Robert is a very famous gay author, uh, extremely famous. And he lives in LA. And he would be able to tell you a lot, I feel sure. He knows about everything uh, gay. <laughs> uh, and he wrote a play called The Haunted Host, uh, which I directed, his first play. And subsequently, at, at Circle Rep, I did a lot of plays that were, became historically very important. I did a play called The Fifth of July, which was the first time uh, that two so-called normal behaving men were lovers. Um, and, you know, played by Jeff Daniels and Christopher Reeve. What's well, the name of it again? Huh? What's the name of it again? Fifth of July. Fifth of July. Yeah. One, you know, nominated for the Tony Award, won a Tony Award, in fact, uh, for Best Supporting Actress yeah, for, yeah. Um, I had subsequently directed a play called As Is, which was the first, the first play about AIDS. Mm -hmm. And it moved to Broadway, it was a success off Broadway, moved to Broadway, won the um, dr Drama uh, Desk Award for Best Play of 1983, so. Uh, so I, and I directed a play by Larry Kramer called The Destiny of Me which was a prequel to his other play, uh, uh, The Normal Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, Larry brought me The Normal Heart, and I, I didn't want to do it because I had already had As Is, and I thought As Is was a much more lyrical play that would influence people. I thought Larry's play was so angry, I was afraid it would turn people off. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, it turned out it was a big success as well, mm -hmm. but uh, As Is, I think, reached more people at the time. Uh, I'm sure it did. And um, so I didn't do that play, but I did Larry's subsequent play uh, about his early life as a, as a growing up as a gay kid. So uh, I was, have been very involved in gay rights activities, um, and AIDS uh, especially. Uh, Larry, of course, as you know, was gay, uh, with the gay men's health crisis and uh, ACT UP. Um, I was on the periphery of those uh, by virtue of association with Larry. Um, back in uh, my, again, when I was a teenager, the only gay uh, organization was a, play, a thing called the Mattachine Society. And I ha had heard of that, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think they met in little groups. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, had cocktails, I don't know, but it was not very active. And in in, I don't know what Medicine Society did. Somewhere around there, though, there began to be j gay publications as well. And that made a big difference. Uh, the Advocate, 
uh, which I did, they did a cover story on me uh, at one point. And, the, you know, uh, of course, they listed all the, the hustlers in the uh, back pages where you could, for a few bucks, get a nice night, you know. So that was uh, a big change uh, when the, by the time The Advocate came out. As I said, the Mattachine Society, they may have had a, I think they had a booklet of some kind, or, or maybe it was a magazine. I, I don't know. I don't think I read it uh, until The Advocate. So, what, um, so you seem like you obviously had a story to it. And, um, you know, especially when you, you mentioned that, you know, and obviously you're having you know, pictures of Russia like this. It's, it's understanding all different types of perspectives from all different types of um, yeah. people. And, and so you said that a lot of your actors have been through the theater. So if you want to sort of encapsulate how, like if you're looking at your life now in a whole snapshot and looking at your contribution to the movement and to understanding and to art, what would you think that would be? Well, I think, uh, I, uh, you know, as I said, the first AIDS play. I, I contributed quite a, quite a lot, I, th I think, um, artistically. I, I sort of became known as the gay Elia Kazan, my hero, that uh, he wasn't gay, but I was, and uh, I was known as, uh, I was out uh, from an early, early uh, time on because of, uh, of Bacino, I think, you know, Bacino, J Joe was always really uh, able to emphasize, you know, you're a, you're a man, never mind, uh, you know, that you're gay. I mean, don't, don't, don't feel that that makes you inferior in some kind of way. So uh, there was a lot of encouragement from Joe, and Meanwhile, my psychoanalysis didn't go so well. I attempted suicide uh, when I was 20, well, when my first love affair broke up. And I was trying still to change my sexuality. And after that, I, I didn't. I, I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm gay. I'm going to accept I'm gay. And, and, uh, and that would have been, uh, you know, uh, well, sometime between 64 and 68 uh, or so. Um, Stonewall is 69? Is that 69, yeah. 69. Huh, I would have thought it was like a year earlier than that. Because uh, by 68, I was already, I was doing The Madness of Lady Bride in London at that point. Uh, and we'd already had big success with it uh, in New York. So uh, I think the Stonewall came to a certain extent as a result of uh, a, fr a greater freedom that was uh, partly the result of places like the Cafe Chino and uh, growing more, more and more bars were opening. It wasn't just the Cherry Lane anymore. There were bars all over the place. And uh, people were, I think drugs had a lot to do with it. I think, uh, you know, smoking grass and uh, LSD uh, uh, and uh, all, all these uh, psychedelic drugs, they had a big, effect on, in terms of lowering people's uh, resistance to, you know, moral resistance. Uh, it, all that was seen as bullshit and people realized, hey, it's okay, if I like it, I'll do it, you know. Uh, and I, I think drugs had a lot, a lot to do with it. And by the time Stonewall came along, uh, as I said, I, I think that was a, 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 it was a big turning point, no, no question, but it was not, it was not, it didn't come out of nowhere. There was a, a, a time that built up from when I first arrived in New York, 61 to 69, where there was a, a growth of more and more uh, acceptance of homosexuality in general. And um, when you ask, uh, looking back on it, uh, I, I, I mentioned 5th of July specifically because uh, the two men in 5th of July are, are, you know, as I said, William Hurt and Jeff Daniels. Subsequently, uh, on Broadway, it was uh, Christopher Reeve, who had played Superman, and, and Jeff Daniels, and then he was replaced by Richard Thomas, who had done, you know, Little House of Prayer, what, not whatever that thing was, uh, the Waltons, uh, and uh, Jeff. And we would do things like, you know, when we were doing student matinees, the kids, you know, the adolescents would come, and they'd go, ah! they, for the, first, the play started with the two men kissing, right up front. There was two big guys kissing each other. And they'd go, oh, Superman's a fag, you know, or John Boy's a fag. But you know, that was adolescent stuff. Uh, it was, and people were still, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty shocking 
uh, I remember Joyce Reeling was in the play, uh, said she was, one night, she overheard uh, uh, an old man and lady were sitting in like the second row center, and Jeff comes in and kisses uh, Christopher Reeve, and uh, she leaned over to her husband and said, you must be his son, because they, that's, they couldn't explain it any other way. They, they didn't know, how, it was beyond their experience that two men would kiss. So uh, it was pretty much at the beginning of all this, and I believe uh, subsequently, I mean, I, I sort of believed that we had a, something to do with the evolution that led to marriage equality. Because I think without Fifth of July, I'm not sure it would have happened the way it happened. Uh, it, it, Why do you say that? Because uh, it was the first time that large audiences were able to go and see a play about gay men that was not self-hate. It was about two normal guys who happened to be gay. Uh, and the play was not about them being gay at all. It was just a given circumstance, it was, you know, a, a given. So it normalized uh, the way people saw the homosexual relationship. We had gone a long way from, from uh, Boys in the Band to Fifth of July. And uh, we went a long way that subsequently, I mean, it took a, a number of years, because the 5th of July was uh, 1978, and marriage equality wasn't until 2004, uh, or 2011, I mean. So it was still a number of years before that finally came along. But it got the ball rolling. So 2015, I think, is like a long period. Sorry? Marriage equality was 2015, so I think it's a long No, no, two, 2011. I was, decision, uh, I, I was married in 2011. Oh, no, no, but the actual, I think the legal Supreme Court decision was 2015. The Supreme Court, yeah, but we were already uh, legal in New York. Well, yeah. New York, it was, it was uh, believe me, I was married on July 25th, uh, 2011, uh, at City Hall. I was, we were, my husband and I were the first gay men married in New York State. Oh, wow. We were there, we, I, we went down to get a marriage license. I'd, Saying, you know, you would be, would be able to marry an elsewhere, but I kept saying, I'm not going to get married until it's legal in my state. When it's legal in my state, I'm going to do it. So they had just passed it. it was, uh, we went down to get a marriage license, and they said, you're going to get married while you're here? And I said, I didn't know you could do that. I thought you had to wait three weeks or something. He said, no, no, get a judge to sign it, and you, we can marry you right here and now. I said, okay. But because I was sort of a famous person, there were a bunch of television cameras and what have you, and newspapers and whatever, they were all excited about the fact that I was getting married. And uh, CBS said, do you mind if we film the wedding? I said, no, come on in. I hadn't planned to get married that day, but so we bought two white caps that said groom on them. And uh, we had, fortunately, we had a, our, uh, our best friend, Denise Yaney, was, just happened to be with us to go get the marriage license. So she was acted as best man, as it were, best person. And uh, it was on the CBS on the evening news. Uh, do you have a copy of that? Or well, it's a, available online, yeah. No, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, go, to, go, to, go to YouTube and uh, look for First Gay Couple. Okay. Or so, something, like, yeah, New York State. Um, subsequently, we were married uh, in a religious ceremony on August 6th. Uh, this was on July 25th. We were married at St. John the Divine, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine at the high altar with uh, really a beautiful, extravagant wedding, 200 of our closest friends. And, uh, you know, tourists were coming in from all over looking at, my God, there's a gay wedding going on at St. John the Divine. So, so looking back, uh, you know, the turning points, 5th of July was uh, going back to Lady Bright, the Madness of Lady Bright, the first play about openly gay you know, drag queen, just really out there. And then um, subsequently, uh, years later, 5th of July, and uh, as I said, Haunted Host came in there as well, other gay plays, but uh, 5th of July was a big turning point. And then uh, As Is, first play about AIDS on Broadway. Uh, and uh, I was nominated for a Tony Award. It won best play of the year. Um, so those are big, when you say looking back on my career, I, I think I was a fairly big contributor to, uh, to the, get the movement, as it were, in my own way, in an artistic way. Where do you think we are now? 
Well, I like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that we've come so far. We still have a ways to go. Uh, ma mainly now, I think the, the issue has moved to transgender. Uh, and uh, again, that was something that I might not have been comfortable with when I was a teenager. My God, you know, uh, but uh, uh, as I said, Lady Bright uh, was, was uh, a drag queen. I don't know if you, if drag queens are considered transgender. I don't know how, how, how you, uh, the cross dressing, I don't know. But uh, now, of course, the, the, we, we are at the point where there's been a lot of equality uh, came about as a result of Obama. Uh, and, uh, and now it's, it seems to be being rolled back by Trump. So uh, uh, this latest thing that they're going to determine your sex by what you were born, the equipment you were born with, uh, thereby rolling back all the advances that we've made in transgender is really uh, a horrible, horrible situation. So there's yet lots to be done. But, um, and you know, I think throughout the country, not everybody is as liberal as, as New York and California and you know, uh, so uh, I, th I think probably s some people living in Mississippi or what have you might still have problems being accepted in the community for being gay. And you have, you know, people like, I won't bake you a cake because you're gay. I mean, you know, that, that's kind of stuff. Um, and, it w and unfortunately, we got a Supreme Court with this latest guy, Kavanaugh. It doesn't look like it's going to be... Uh, uh, any uh, advance in terms of civil rights for gay people or transgender people anytime soon. Really unfortunate. So things seem to be turning backwards at the moment to me, and uh, I think that's really unfortunate. I did, however, uh, this week, I'm, as a result, I said I'm, I'm on a lot of lists, so I, I go to screenings all the time, and uh, night before last I saw a screening of a movie called Girl, which is about a, a person who was born with a penis but who identified as a, a female from the beginning who wants to be a ballet dancer. And it's really quite a touching film. Uh, and uh, uh, after that, just the other night, I saw my friend Nicole Kidman uh, with uh, Russell Crowe uh, and uh, uh, Hedges uh, doing um, a movie called uh, Boy Erased, which is about uh, that horrible thing of trying to therapy to, to change uh, your sexuality to make you you're gay, but we're going to make you straight. And it's a horrible, horrible uh, you know situation. Uh, but th those things, uh, th it's illegal now in some states. I think 16 states, it's illegal, which is progress but there's still a lot of other states where it's not. And so it's the sort of thing that's still going on. It's very, it's quite tragic because, uh, you know, people kill themselves as a result of that kind of unacceptance, lack of acceptance, so. Well, thank you very much. I think, um, no, this is great because I don't want to keep you too long. And we've got, <laughs> we have so many distractions today, but I want to thank you uh, again for your candor and, uh, and just also just your forthrightness with um, Um, no, not that, uh, not really that I can think of. Uh, I've, as I said, I've, uh, once I was okay with my own sexuality, I, I've been, uh, you know, a real contributor, I think, to uh, helping other people uh, reach that kind of peace with themselves. Uh, and I, a big deal to me was the, the marriage equality thing. I was very passionate about that. And when that finally happened in 2011 in New York, and then subsequently held up by the Supreme Court, I felt like we had really changed things, you know, from when I was a kid. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure, Brad.